From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Just when you thought elections were over, there is one more for voters to decide. And while you may not be casting a ballot, you most certainly have a stake in it. Central Falls residents will be deciding on a new mayor after a public corruption case forced former mayor Charles Moreau out of office. City Councilman James Diosa is the heavy favorite to win over former police chief Joseph Moran, but the Moran name is big in the little city. Whoever wins will take control of an urban square mile emerging from bankruptcy and consuming more than $40 million a year of your state tax dollars. Our guest on the first half of Newsmakers, Democratic candidate for mayor of Central Falls, Joseph Moran. Then, walking a mile or more in their shoes. The homeless population in Rhode Island is on the rise, so one writer decided to spend 48 hours on the streets of Providence blogging and tweeting his experience real time as most of us were carving their Thanksgiving turkeys. Homeless like me, a first-hand account of life on the streets with editor of rifuture.org. Bob Plain. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and political reporter for Rhode Island Public Radio, Ian Donis. Good morning, everyone. Morning. And before we get going, I want to make a note that this was supposed to be a debate between Mr. Moran and his opponent, but the uh, Diosa campaign turned us down, so Mr. Moran is appearing on this program without his challenger. Uh, Joe, thanks for coming on the program. We appreciate Th it. Thanks for having me. Let's start with uh, the past, if we, if we could. You were the police chief under Mayor Charles Moreau, who pleaded guilty to public corruption charges and will be sentenced in February. Why would anyone vote for someone who had any ties to that administration? Well, I've worked under four administrations, Tim. I've worked under uh, Mayor Silver. Uh, Mayor Lazier, as, Mayor as Matthews. As chief under those? No, no, but uh, I actually under Mayor Matthews, I was assisting Mayor Matthews with his election when a week before the election when Mayor Morrow had beaten uh, Mayor Matthews, uh, Mayor Morrow ended up saying that I don't care that Joe Moran is working for the Matthews administration helping him. Uh, if I become the mayor, I'm going to make him the police chief. But it wasn't just uh, I work for this guy and I'm the you know, running a department under him. You actively campaigned for Charles Murrow, did you not? Absolutely. You went door to door, not in uniform, and knocked on doors and, and said, hey, you should vote for this guy. Do you think that was appropriate? Well, I think we all have a right to pick our own political influences, and I think the same people that helped uh, Mayor Morrow uh, is now working for uh, Mr. Diosa, my opponent. But the question would be why, um, you know, isn't Central Falls a place more than anywhere else that needs a clean sweep, just new faces, new people, new thinking in that, in that city government? It just went bankrupt. That's never happened in Rhode Island before. Well, that came under the administration. If you look at my administration on the, on the police chief, I mean, I had $1.5 million in grants and appropriations. We bought 26 brand new police cars, three of them the city purchased. The other 23 we had gotten through uh, grants and appropriations, and then we had I had gotten actually from uh, Congressman uh, Kennedy at the time a $350,000 appropriation and, and a few years later another $100,000 to enhance the equipment that we had at the police department. So it's two different administrations in my opinion. Has this been, I mean, I imagine that it's just been a political challenge for you to have ties to him at all. What well, it is a, it's a challenge for me because everyone tries to put uh, me in the same category and, and I find it very uh, difficult to, to break that. Although he was running the city and I was running the police department. It's two separations. One, that he's working off Broad Street in Central Falls and I was working off Illinois Street. And if I didn't spend time on, at the police department, I used to go out at 3 o'clock in the morning and check out the city, uh, I'd be at home. And if I wasn't at home, I'd, I'd be playing ball with my daughters. One of your main arguments against James Diosa is that he lacks experience, but is that really a valid argument given how state oversight is going to remain in place in Central Falls for a number of years and the next mayor is going to have to focus on very basic city functions like snow removal and filling potholes, etc.? Well, the inexperience I'm talking about is, is anybody's going to be able to come in to the city right now because you're going to have to work under the plan that they have, which, in my opinion, uh, you have X amount of dollars to work with. So when I'm talking about the inexperience is 
that when you come in, you have to be innovative. And I think my innovation showed in the police department that we had to make things work with uh, grants, appropriations, and thinking outside the box. And unfortunately, he hasn't showed a plan that he intends to, to bring forward to the city of Central Falls. What's your explanation for why voters overwhelmingly supported Diosa in the first round of mayoral voting, where he got almost 60 percent of the vote? Well, I, I hope it had to do with the presidential election and the congressional uh, election and things like that there because there's usually not that big of a turnout in the city of Central Falls. A lot more people in the city of Central Falls need to be informed about the 20 percent tax increase, for instance, that's, that's coming. Uh, my opponent was supporting that, uh, 4 percent each year for the next five years. That's problematic to the city of Central Falls, especially when, the, you know, the receivership costs are going to be coming to the uh, the people in Central Falls that we're going to have but to pay mayor, for. But as mayor, there's very, if you were to be elected mayor, there's very little you could do about that. That's coming out of the courts. That's, it's under, you know. Well, I, I think when we work with the state, the state just come in the, the newspaper in the Providence Journal approximately seven or eight weeks ago saying that they had a $115 million surplus. And the cost, the state made all the decisions in the city of Central Falls under the receivership. So I look at it that if it costs $5, uh, $5 million to uh, take care of the cost for the receivership, well then instead of the state taking a $115 million surplus, take $5 million and clear up you Central know, Falls. You know, people at home listening to your answer are going to go, wait a minute, I live in Pawtucket, I live wherever, and you, you want to get more money from the state into Central Falls? We're talking, what, more than $40 million a year the state already dumps into that city. Well, they, they do as far as the the school, school. The, the schools, absolutely. Last time I checked, that's still tax dollars. Absolutely, but it was $48 million back in 2006, and the budget went from $11 million in 91 when the state took over the schools to $48 million in 2006, now roughly $40 million today. The difference is, is the oversight. Where's all that money going? Because going back to 2006, if you had a $48 million budget and a $17 million municipal budget, that's $65 million to run one square mile. What would you specifically do to build the tax base in Central Falls so it could have a, a more robust economy? Well, the first thing we have to do, I think, is, is the vacant mills that we have. We have to be innovative. And the first thing I'd like to do is put a letter together showing all the demographics, how we're number one in the income per household, uh, the least amount of income per household in the state, and number one in teenage pregnancies uh, as far as a lot of socioeconomic issues, and put that on a letter and send it out to the Fortune 500 companies to see if anybody would be interested in the city of Central Falls to invest. And I just look at that because I look personally that I thought they should have been doing that under the bankruptcy as I mean you have to cut your expenses but you also have to bring in revenues and and I don't think that was happening under the uh, current administration you've also talked Joe, about uh, <coughs> public private partnerships as a way to, to deal with the fact that you have very little wiggle room in terms of revenue and new budget items could you talk a little about your, your vision there sure for instance they're looking to privatize rubbish I just look at it personally that there's a way that we can possibly get rubbish trucks through the business community and uh, individuals that own property with four or more uh, apartments and how I would do that very simple is is that if you had 200 businesses including the the people that own the houses uh, four units and more they all buy they all have dumpsters so if they pay twelve hundred dollars a a, uh, a year in, in dumpster fees um, first thing we would do is say okay pay the city a thousand dollars and you have to work it out obviously we work with the numbers and that, that gives us two hundred thousand dollars you put that in the bank if it costs hundred fifty thousand dollars for a rubbish truck there's your first year you you buy your rubbish truck you keep fifty in the bank the next year you cut the price down instead of charging them a thousand dollars you charge them five hundred dollars so you still get a hundred thousand plus the fifty in the bank would give you hundred and fifty you buy your second rubbish truck the third year you would be able to get another five hundred dollars you would be able to get a hundred thousand you put that in the bank the fourth year you would repeat what you did in the first year so what what it would basically have is there'd be a uh, one truck in the first year one truck in the second year nothing in the third year the fourth year you get a truck in the fifth year you get a truck and the savings for the business community investing would be two hundred dollars from twelve hundred to a thousand the first year. Have you talked to anybody in the business community? They support it? Absolutely. Well, I, I think they would support it if you sat down and, and, and ironed out all the numbers because the first year they'd save $200 a year, second year they'd save $700, third $700, fourth $700, and fifth $700. So they got a savings of $3,000. When you talk that in the business community, obviously the taxes going up and all the costs that are taking place, you know, a, a $3,000. Uh, savings over five years is average $600 a year. Mr. Moran, before the city went into uh, receivership, May
Mayor Moreau allowed you to collect an annual pension of $50,000 and continue as chief and earn another about $71,000 annually. That, that's not including the benefits. Why would you ever do that in a city that was hurting so badly? Well, it had nothing to do per se because what, what happened is they would have to have somebody as the police chief first of all. Second of all, they were trying to cut the benefits that were coming statewide as far as your sick time payout and things like that there. So that was the reason for that. But there's a, a town in the state of Rhode Island that uh, the past police chief retired and stayed as well as the current police chief retired and stayed. There's 20 police chiefs right now that currently collect a pension from different different places and uh, they, uh, they work in their respective right. towns. And, and, and so that makes it right? No, no, I'm not saying it's right. I just, I, there's nothing wrong with it, in my opinion, and I actually well, saved let's money. Let's talk about the difference Absolutely. between those 20 chiefs, because they are, um, by and large, are retired state troopers that are, that became, um, that became police chiefs, and people might have even a problem with that. We're talking about an individual who was a police chief, retired in that position, and then hired in that same position. Can you see why that would drive people bananas at home? Well, I understand the perception, but what, I, what I'm talking it's about... It's not perception, it's fact. Well, it's fact. It's, it's a salary you collected on top of a pension at the same time. Well, that's the contracts that we had years ago. When I first signed on to be a police officer, I got on a police department at 21 years old, and I served the time that we normally would serve in the capacity of the contract. Once a contract expires, you know, at 40, 41 years old, I could have retired, and, and we actually got a penalty because of the bankruptcy. We got a penalty for retiring early, which that was part of the contract. Why wouldn't you say, Mayor Moreau, thank you, I, I appreciate the offer, I'm good with my salary for now, and I'll collect my pension when I retire? Well, like I said before, there's another town that done it. I had done some research. I didn't think that there was an issue with it, but... Uh, would you give the same deal to your police chief if you're elected mayor? Uh, I would look at it and see if it saved the city money because they actually saved the city money with me staying as the police chief. How so? Well, because I didn't have to hire another individual on the job. Therefore, they had to pay the medical benefits until age 65 according to the contract to begin with. So therefore, if you get a $17,000 uh, medical benefit, if that's what it is for the family plan, they wouldn't have to pay that for somebody coming the on the job. The city could have also saved money if you turned down the pension and just collected your salary. Well, that could have been as well. Okay. Yeah. Do you support the idea of merging Central Falls with any of its neighboring communities? I don't necessarily support the idea of, of merging the city. I think the city can stand on its own two feet if we're given the, the potential. I, I don't think that anyone can just feed money to a city and, and not expect. I, I think if you talk to anybody in the city of Central Falls, we want to be self-sufficient. You say uh, when you were running the police department that was separate from City Hall, but a lot of people probably wonder why did it have to get so bad in Central Falls before it got better? What would you say? As far as in the city's what? financial condition. Well, I can't speak for the financial condition, except I can speak for the $3.1 million budget that I handled at the police department. I was under budget every but year. But you're, you're a Central Falls resident. You've lived there your whole life. What is your perspective on why it had to get so bad before there was some glimmers of hope for the future? Well, I think in, a few years ago, Governor Kacheri at the time, then Governor Kacheri, cut $2 million right out of the budget to begin with in the middle of a budget cycle. And when you do that and you cut it out in the middle of, bu of a budget cycle, you run into a problem as far as a financial uh, projections in the city. Joe, I want to ask you, uh, sure. wrap up this segment here and ask you a question <clears throat> that I received on Twitter. I didn't have a lot of time to vet this, so I want to have you sure. uh, weigh in on it. Uh, a person wrote uh, that a youth football team of which you were vice president was badly mismanaged and had to be saved by a, a hip-hop artist, uh, and they wanted to know if you can really manage a whole city. I did a little reading on it. It was the Central Falls Panthers, fell $20,000 in the red, and this uh, person stepped up, according to the blog, and got a program going again, and they went on undefeated. What, what happened there, and what role did you play? Well, they're, uh, I don't know exactly what they're talking about as far as mismanaged. I was a vice president. What they don't specify in there is that I, I wrote a, a $13,000 grant for the Champlin Foundation to even out the billing that took place with the Central Falls Panthers to begin with. And I also, a few years ago, uh, the girls, we actually started the season with $27, and we ran some fundraisers. We got through the entire year. Not only did we get through the entire year, the girls had won the cheerleading competition. They come in first in the state. They come in f uh, fourth in, uh, excuse me, first in New England. And then uh, we had to raise some money so we could send them to Arizona. I ended up raising in six days $9,500, and we sent them to Arizona where we come in fourth place. So I don't know what they're talking about as far as that goes. And we should also point out Central Falls has one heck of a chess team, don't Absolutely. they, the high school? They, Absolutely. They win state championships pretty consistently. The, the kids in Central Falls are extremely uh, 
very well in sports. I mean, we had a couple of All-Americans uh, recently in track uh, for the city of Central Falls. The uh, the pass, the wrestling team always does well. The football team, the... Uh, I like how you lump the chess team in, uh, into <laughs> athletics. <laughs> With wrestling I, I and football, that. Well, it well, can be full contact. I, I have to say that, being the captain of the high school baseball team back <laughs> in 1980. So I, I think the sports program in the city of Central Falls, the teachers, the, the coaches do a phenomenal job. The students, I mean, we had some volleyball champions uh, for the city of Central Falls, state champions, the soccer team state champions and things like that so we got a lot of good well-educated and uh, very good sports-minded individuals in the city all right Joseph Moran is a candidate for mayor in Central Falls thank you for joining us and I want to remind you that the election is on December 11th coming up homeless like me a local writer decides to spend 48 hours over Thanksgiving on the streets of Providence you want to stick around and hear his stories stay with us you're watching newsmakers Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. I am joined on the panel by WPRI.com's uh, Ted Nisi and Ian Donis from Rhode Island Public Radio. Our guest for the second half is the editor of RIFuture.org, Bob Plain, and he spent 48 hours on the streets of Providence while the rest of us were with family and friends enjoying their turkey at home. Um, you did this to draw the attention to the growing homeless population, I suppose not only in Rhode Island but nationally. Yes. Uh, it, why else did you do this? What made you decide, you know what, this sounds like a good idea to me, to be out in the cold, and let, let's face it, it's not always the safest place to be. Yeah, um, so part of it was also that I wanted, a, 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 a lot of the attention that the media gives on Thanksgiving tends to be about consumerism and capitalism, and I wanted to kind of, you know, shine a light on the fact that not everyone is in the position to go shopping on Buy Nothing Day. Let's, uh, I, you took some pictures um, out there. You were tweeting and blogging, and you can see all those on rifuture.org. Here's some of the pictures that you took. This one is particularly uh, was a uh, this was amazing to me. It was a, a homeless man that was just trying to read a book by the light of a Coke machine. Yeah, I thought that was a great picture that you snapped. And we're going to show some more of these pictures as we chat with you here. Uh, I want you to talk specifically about one night you had on the lawn of the State House. Seemed kind of harrowing, and it made you decide that maybe tomorrow night I'm going to go to a homeless shelter. You even slept with a knife. Talk yeah, about that. Yeah, night. just, you know, in case the worst possible scenario happened, I thought better safe than sorry. But honestly, the most dangerous it got was I think three college students walked up and got more freaked out by me than I was by them. Yeah, but we've seen uh, nationally uh, where people can just assault the homeless. Uh, out there it might be booze fueled or something like that, but th that, that happens. Absolutely, and in fact, I was just as afraid of being assaulted by you know middle class college kids than lower class homeless people. I don't think there's any reason to assume one's more dangerous than the other. Bob, what was the thing that most surprised you about your experience of being temporarily homeless? So I played this game when I was walking around where I tried to make eye contact with as many people as I could. And I assumed all the people who looked, you know, gainfully homeful that had homes would try and, you know, not look at me. We should point out you were dressed the part. Yeah, I, I, I did what I could to dress the part. I had a big backpack on filled with kind of laundry in my sleeping bag and wore like my gardening clothes. And that picture you took of yourself at the State House, which we used at the opening of the program, I mean, you've seen better days. Let's put it that way after yeah, a while. Yeah, yeah, honestly, I've seen worse too. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so anyway, continue. So I expected, you know, kind of the people who looked like they came from homes to not want to look at me. What surprised me is I also tried to make con eye contact with a lot of the homeless folk. And it surprised me that at first they weren't making eye contact with me. You know, I thought we would be kind of brothers in this right off, right off the bat. And my guess about that is, is when there's a new guy on the street Nobody knows whether to trust him, if he's a good guy, if he's a bad guy. Bob, uh, I got an email while you were out from one of our more conservative viewers, uh, right-leaning viewers, while you were doing this, and he said to me, he was skeptical, he said, if a cross-section of Rhode Island ever tried being homeless and, and met everyone who's out there, uh, quote, their reaction would not be to urge more services for those people. On the contrary, the reaction would not be pleasing to the poverty industry. What do you think of that reaction? Well, uh, so I did a post after the fact that kind of spoke to that, you know, and I said, I didn't really do a good job of 
of, of, of painting a picture of what homelessness in Rhode Island looks like. What I did is I kind of, you know, talked to the people that were the easiest to talk to. But they're not indicative, you know, like the mentally ill and the drunk people that we see on Kennedy Plaza, they're in no way indicative of people who are homeless in Rhode Island. They're the easiest to spot. Homelessness in Rhode Island looks like me, it looks like you, it looks like you. You know, we're all kind of one paycheck in our in our in, in our in our in our network away from being right there. One, one of the things you had pointed out in your writing was that uh, somebody at the shelter told you that ho holidays can actually be uh, easier on the shelters because a lot of uh, of the homeless, like the rest of us, visit family or friends over over the holidays, and that. It almost seems sadder to me in a way that, that, you know, I know it's easy for me to say, but why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't the family just take them in? You know, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that's what you mean by you saw a lot more of what was a stereotypical homeless on the street as opposed to the, the family that was homeless because they were actually away with other family members at the time. Yeah, I'm guessing there are all the reasons in the world and some of them are bad on the people that aren't taking them in and some of them are because those people that are on the streets have probably burned a bunch of a bunch of bridges and in the same way that like I'll go out and spend 48 hours on the streets around the holidays and some people will go and volunteer at the you know local community meal some people that have family members who are homeless might kind of open their hearts at that time of but year. a lot of it is addiction too isn't it did you see a lot of that yeah yeah I did um, the statistics in th that I saw in Rhode Island from the coalition for the homeless was actually that there's only 13% of the homeless population is, suffers from alcohol and drug addiction. I'm guessing that's, that's low, mm -hmm. but I also don't think it's as high as we may assume. Why don't we, gentlemen, shift gears here for a moment. I, I want to ask you about um, the holiday tree. You are one of the, it seems like one of the few defenders of yeah. Governor Chaffee the holiday tree. Uh, why? Um, so I am not defending it because I think it's important that we call it a holiday tree or a Christmas tree or whatever you want to have it. But I think there are a couple of bullies in our local media marketplace that aren't allowing, you know, what's happened for, you know, several different gubernatorial administrations. And I think it's important that someone sticks up to loud mouse when 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 they yeah act but like you know bullies. what I bet you if we did a poll and we asked mm -hmm. uh, Rhode Islanders uh, should should it be called a Christmas tree or a holiday tree what do you think the answer would be overwhelming I think if you added a third option that was who cares that would win <laughs> resoundingly <laughs> but even Governor Deval Patrick where they call it a holiday tree in the official thing he said well of yep. course it's a Christmas tree what do you say to people who say why why doesn't Governor Chafee sure print it like Governor Kachiri did. Uh, on the, the same invitation holiday tree, why doesn't the governor just come out and say, well, of course it's a Christmas tree? Should he? I, I think he kind of did when he said at home I call it a Christmas tree. And I actually think it's pretty enlightened that he's making a stand on this and sticking up to Bill O'Reilly. And I think it's really cool that we're trying to be inclusive of more people. And, you know, there's more people that celebrate holidays this time of year than there are that celebrate Christmas. What kind of impact do you expect in the new legislative session from the election of a couple more progressive lawmakers? I'm hoping we see marriage equality come up. I'm hoping we see tax equity come up and pass this year. Um, I'd like to see payday lending. Um, I'm not sure which one of those will come up and will pass, but those are kind of on my wish list. Bob, I'm curious about the sort of the economics of what you do. People at home, uh, they might, you know, I, I blog for Channel 12, but I have the whole structure of Channel 12 to sort of take care of me yeah. in terms of the business model here. Uh, you, for you, it's a full-time job, and you are, you, as I understand it, you're the ad salesman as well as the editor as well as the lead writer. Mm. I mean, don't forget floor sweeper. Floor sweeper, <laughs> exactly, everything. How, you know, how does that work for you? As a, is it a sustainable business model, I guess? Yeah, so I, I mean, obviously I haven't starved to death yet, but I would like, you know, like everyone else in the world, I'd like more money too. Mm -hmm. So, so it's so it's working for you. You so see, far, this is so something good. you can keep doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just want to pivot back to uh, the homelessness uh, question here. And Joe Moran had to face a question from Twitter. Now you do. Uh, somebody tweeted to me that uh, you know they saw they read your blog, which is a good thing, yep. and that they saw that you were fed 
at different shelters, yeah. but you're actually not homeless. Right. Have you gone back since then and donated to those shelters? No, I haven't. My, my family has in the past. So my family does this thing where instead of giving uh, Christmas presents, we decide a, an organization to donate to, and we've done crossroads in the past. So I haven't yet, but I have in the past. And the other thing, there's absolutely no shortage of food for homeless people in Rhode Island. I'm guessing a, a good amount of it actually gets thrown away. Food isn't the problem. Shelter. Shelter is the issue. There's also, uh, Rhode Island just became the first state in the nation to pass a homeless bill of rights. Do you think that will make things easier for the people you met? Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. so. Yeah, well, I'm hoping now that there's awareness of the fact that, you know, like our elected officials think that it's important enough to pass a law saying, hey, these people n deserve their civil rights too, that folks like us in the media will say, hey, if the, if the government's passing laws like that, maybe we should look into how their rights are being infringed upon. Uh, 30 seconds left. Have you gone back? Uh, you spent some time and interviewed some of the people on the streets. Have you gone back to see them at all? No, but I gave out my phone number to some of them, and uh, there, there were one or two who actually expressed an interest in blogging for RI Future, so I hope that, that, that comes to fruition. If they can get access to a phone, pay phones are harder to come by at this yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, Bob Plain, editor for Rhode Island, uh, rifuture.org, thank you very much for joining us on the program. If, if you want to see any of his uh, tales of life on the streets over 48 hours, you can go to his website, rifuture.org, and he has a write-up there for Ted Nisi and Ian Donis. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. Good job.